time we land, there's going to be four inches of snow an hour. And uh, I thought, we're landing like four o'clock in the afternoon. I said, it's okay though, because I'm going to Dartmouth. And Dartmouth is like one of those little spots just right outside the ring road in Boston. Right? It's going to be easy. It's no big deal. I don't, have a big, I don't have a big transportation issue going on. So I fly out there. By the time I land, sure enough, it's snowing four inches an hour. Uh, it's a full white out. We barely got to land. And then I go to the rental car counter, it hurts. And I, you know, I got lined up like a Chevy spec or something like that, some like little mini boxy car. And I said, well, I'm going to Dartmouth. I'm going to go give a talk at Dartmouth. And the guy said, well, you need a four-wheel drive. You need a RAV4. Now, RAV4 is a pretty common car now. This is the first year it was introduced. So I said, oh, okay, great. I'll take a four-wheel drive. <coughs> so by then, this is the first time I checked the map. And it's a rental car map. And you know how the rental car maps work, right? You open it up, and the first thing you see is, the like, the city center. You know, it kind of gives you, like, a, you know, the, the urban density thing. And I look, and I think, okay. Dartmouth's not in the city center in Boston. I know it's just like just outside. So I go to the next map. It has like the beltway that goes right here. Uh, the beltway that goes around Dartmouth. And I look and I think, hey, I see Nashua. I see these other things. But where's Hanover, New Hampshire? Like it's not very close to there. And uh, and then I open up. I flip over to the other side. It has the whole New England on the map. And I'm like, holy crap. Like, that's four hours from here. <laughs> and it's the first time, and I'm not kidding, the first time I realized I did it. So it's getting dark. I got my RAV4, and I got to set out for Hanover, New Hampshire, which is quite a long way from Boston. So I get in the car, and I turn on the traffic radio station. And they're coming on, and they say, you know, the Nor'easter's hitting four inches of snow an hour. You know, we're shutting down the schools. We're shutting down the churches. We're shutting down the hospitals. Like, it's just epic. And I said, oh, my God, this is going to be horrible. So I'm driving along. I'm driving along. Gradually, the traffic kind of dies down. Like, there's nobody around. It's getting darker and darker. Now, here's where I have to ask a cultural question. I expect good answers for this here at JMU. When well, I do this at Harvard, the answers don't come back very well. So has anybody ever seen the movie Death Race 2000? Okay, this is like it's like a cultural experience. If you haven't, it's on Netflix. It's like it just missed winning the Oscar. Right? So, so Death Race 2000, and I'm like in Death Race 2000. It's snowing four inches an hour. It's dark. I'm in my Rav4, and everything I'm going to tell you now is true. First thing I see is a guy coming down the freeway. He leaves his part of the freeway and comes all the way across my parking lot. There's a median strip in the middle, and he manages to get all the way across my car, and I'm driving. So I'm like, okay, I gotta keep driving, I keep driving. The next thing I see is uh, like, a, like an Impala or something like that, vertical, in the ditch, with the blinkers, like the lights going on, and they're like the blinkers going up into the heavens, and then the snow coming down and down. So I keep driving, I'm driving and driving, and then by then, there's, I mean, like the, it, there's, it's completely apocalyptic. Right? Even the radio stations are like quiet. There's nothing. <laughs> no cars on the road whatsoever. And then the last thing I remember passing was a uh, like one of these bobtail trucks, like a like a like a FedEx truck, small one with the, with the back that's kind of got like a hump on it. So I passed this FedEx truck, and uh, and it was on fire. <laughs> and, and so, if you remember, like the old westerns, like they had the Conestoga wagons, you know, and then like it's on fire, and then the tines of the wagon are kind of glowing. Well, that's what this truck looked like. So it's on fire, and I kid you not, there are people standing around it, like scarves, <laughs> warming their hands, and they're trying to this fire. So that was my experience, and then I said, and then finally, eventually, I made it to Hanover. Which turned out to be an absolutely gorgeous place, by the way, if any of you have ever been there. So I check in at the Hanover Inn, I'm just relieved to be there, and then I go show up to the class and I do my kind of my stump speech, my normal talk, which is take companies from zero to hundred million dollars. And I get in, I do my talk, and it's it's the entrepreneurship school, it's the business school. So I mean, yeah, it's pretty pretty elite school and, and very really sharp kids that are that are in this program. And so then I finish. And then they, they come up, which is often happens afterwards, and they come and start talking about the projects they're working on. I remember it's 2001, it's so actually probably, you guys are getting to be so young, you won't know this stuff, but, um, but you know, it's post the dot-com crash. So I got like 10 little little company idea people, little like business school you know, groups that come up, and like nine out of the 10 have sort of petsfood.com. Right? They got something like that. And I listen, and I say, okay, that's been done. I kind of listen to the whole thing. And then the next, the final group that came up with these kids, uh, uh, Tim and David. Tim and David are, uh, I've gotten to know them quite well since then. And they're, 
they're sort of formidable physically. They're hockey players, right? So they're, they're like, you kind of see them and they kind of have a presence. And then they were really thoughtful. They had done this project while they were in school. And, uh, and the project, I'll explain how the project works. So what's your name? Okay. Uh, Leon. Leon. Okay, so Leon. Leon, you run IBM Southern Connecticut. You run operations. Okay. All right, so that's good. And then, uh, <laughs> what's, what's your name? Carolyn. Carolyn. Okay, so Carolyn, you run the utility for Southern Connecticut. You run whatever that is, Southern Connecticut Power. Okay, so this was their business school class project, what I'm going to explain to you now. So they went to Leon and they said, Leon, you know, you're the head of operations for this thing. Nobody cares about you. Right. You're a cost center. You know, right? It's like, yeah, I know, I know. It's a miserable life. He said, however, we'll pay you $100,000 a year. And in exchange for that, what you're going to do is you're going to let us install these little, like, uh, um, backup power generation uh, appliances. And what they're going to do is we're going we're to notify. We'll give you a half an hour's notice. We're going to kick on that pack up, backup appliance thing maybe six or seven times a year. And you're going to sign a contract with us, and we won't do it for more than a few hours at a time. And you're like, yeah, well, that's, I do that anyway. That's how I test my equipment. That's how I test my backup capability. So you just told me you're going to pay me 100 grand, 200 grand to do my backup for me. So now I'm, a, I'm not only my profit center, I'm a charisma center in the company. So now you're feeling great. Okay, so now we go over to Carol, and we say, Carol, I've got 20 megawatts of power that I gathered from really reputable guys like me um, and companies like IBM and also the college district and these other places. And I can deliver that, deliver that power to you in half an hour's notice when you need peak power, right? And so Carol's sitting there thinking, okay, I spent last summer testifying before Congress. I had some of my uh, customers die, literally, because we had brownouts and blackouts because we couldn't handle peak power, right? We got into situations where it hit 110 degrees, or not, that's California like 100 degrees in, in Connecticut, and everybody turned their air conditioning on, and then the, the utility came, right? So I could really use that. And so as it turns out, there's a market price for that. It's $90,000 a megawatt. And so you said, I'll take all you can give me. And so a marketplace was born. And this was, again, a class project. They called it Energy Network Operations Center. And it turned into something called Enernoc, which is now on the, on the uh, uh, NASDAQ exchange, the ENOC. So we met these kids there, and they had this really creative idea. We stayed in touch, kind of talked to them. They raised a little bit of local money. And then they came back, and we put in sort of their scale capital. We put in about $20 million um, for about 20% of the company. And then two years after that, the company went public, and they were worth a billion dollars in just that short time period. So we deployed $20 million in capital. We made $200 million, and we did it in 24 months because we met these really sharp kids after I drove through the snowstorm in Hanover, New Hampshire. And so that is the reason I do these talks, because I'm looking for another internet. It's just that simple, right? And I want to encourage you all to think about starting companies, because it's really, really powerful metaphor. Now, yeah, okay, we can go into the details of David David. They both became centimillionaires. That is really cool. But more than anything, they had like this vision, and they, they exercised it, right? They, they went and did it. They executed it. They're still doing it. They're number one and number two in the company. It's 11 years, 13 years later now that they're still doing it. Um, so that's one story that I like to tell about entrepreneurship. And there's another one that I won't get into the details of how I ended up getting as involved as this turned out to be, but I'll tell it through this uh, clip from this movie. I call myself the accidental entrepreneur. You have to be a street fighter. We didn't know what we were doing. Silicon Valley had to go break for hundred thousand dollars. Billion dollars in Apple and San Francisco. Do markets rolling companies. Companies. companies? I remember the rest of this one. The company was started with two hundred and fifty dollars, and so we never had any money. You have to be right. These are very fragile companies with a lot of things missing. Any new business seldom does what's written in the business plan. The risks were just enormous. You could walk down the street in 1976 and talk to 100 people and say, would you like a personal computer? And they go, well, what's that? Jobs and Wozniak came up to see me, and they were very unappealing. They were very <laughs> They didn't smell good. They dressed funny. <laughs> so Woz had designed really 
wonderful computer. I was convinced this was a big market just embryonically beginning. When you see it, you know it. It's just that it goes right through your bones. At the time we started genetic, there was no such thing as genetic engineering. I said, well, what if God or Darwin won't let us make a new life form? But we had our breakthrough. It was a new idea, but it was a good one. If they had stayed together, probably there'd be no silicon and silicon valley. Well, isn't it great if you can make money and change the world for the better at the same time? So, if you think about like the stories uh, that went on behind this, so this is a movie that I produced about uh, four years ago. Um, and it makes it sound like I produced movies. I can barely spell it, right? I mean, it just was like, it was a, a series of accidents that led to me raising money and then hiring filmmakers and making this film because I, I clearly have a passion around entrepreneurship. I should note, however, when I was here, I couldn't spell entrepreneurship. I could barely spell entrepreneurship still, but I definitely couldn't then. My dad worked for the government. I didn't know anybody in my life that really had an entrepreneurial career or any of that kind of stuff, right? I got exposed to all that stuff later. So if you don't feel like your bones at this point at 20 or 21 years old, it doesn't make any difference. It could happen later. It certainly happened to me later. But you look at the companies themselves, right? And these are obviously household names now, Apple, Cisco, Genentech, and Atari. But just think about the scale of opportunity that was created with something like this, right? One of the little clips in the video shows that check. That check is famous famous for a bunch of reasons, but that's Mike Markola, who wrote a $100,000 check to Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak to get Apple started. Apple was started with about, I don't know, seven or $800,000, maybe $900,000 of seed funding. And then there was some other money that got put in, but that seed funding probably represented, let's call it 50% of the ownership of the company, right? So <coughs> Apple's down a little bit now, it's only it's down to about $480 billion in market cap. <laughs> It was up, you know, close to $600 billion in market cap. So let me just tell you, like, straight out. Becoming an entrepreneur is one of the only ways that middle class people can become fabulously wealthy. Right? It's just, I mean, you can, you can deal coke. That's another option that has different risks. Right? But if you don't want to deal coke, you want to do something like this. And most of the people that did this, they're not like, you know, inherently wealthy people. And some of them are pretty smart people, but they're not like the smartest people. But they were really determined. They really had a strong idea of what they wanted to do. So that million dollars, assuming you can make your pro rata contribution over time, that turned into two or three hundred billion dollars, right? So that's pretty good. Um, and then Atari, really good story. Cisco is kind of a similar story. When, uh, when Don Valentine or Sequoia led the investment in Cisco, he put in $3 million for 30% of the company. The company is around, has at times been valued around $200 million, a little bit lower than that now. Um, Genentech, fabulously valuable company, but more than anything else, Genentech's probably saved the lives of 10 or 20 million people, maybe more than that over the course of time from the, uh, the things that have been, that have been done there. And um, I think what's, what's important to understand about that, I'm going to kind of go through this real quick. It's important to understand about that is that uh, you could have been in any one of those things. It wasn't, there's nothing like, yeah, maybe you're not Wozniak and you didn't design the computer, but that's not, you know, they had a lot of other people that were there early on and did some great stuff. So, um, I moved out to the Silicon Valley. I was at JMU, uh, graduated in 82, then I went to UVA, I moved out in 84. And so I've been out there for 29 years. And it took me like 20 years to understand what I'm going to explain now. But it's pretty simple. So here's how kind of our ecosystem, the world in which I live, works. So you get like friends and family. I'm a mercenary manager, which means I haven't had an original idea in my life for the most part. But I've gotten hooked up with some people that have incredible ideas. And that's another thing I'd like to have you take from this. Like, you don't have to be Bill Gates, but it'd be great if you're like the second or third guy hanging around with Bill Gates. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> uh, universities have a big influence. I want you, JMU to have a bigger influence over time, and, and I know that it will. But certainly, you know, places like Stanford, MIT, and Caltech, and others have a big deal. 
Yeah, venture capitalists have a role, but typically a little bit later. Angels are really important angel investors, um, which are also sometimes uh, friends and family. And then vendors. And the vendor thing's important because I lived in Europe for a while and I was trying to explain how the Silicon Valley worked. And I said to people, okay, here's what you got to understand. If you start a company, you get a law firm. The law firm works for nothing. And then you get an accounting firm. And the accounting firm works for nothing, right? That's, there's, a, there's like this sort of collaborative thing that's really hard to explain in other more established economies because they're doing that because they think downstream if the company goes well, they're going to do all right. And that's worked out very well for them. But what's in the center of all this stuff? Well, the center is the entrepreneur. And when I really came up with kind of the idea around this, and not this whole thing, this TM thing, that's kind of true. I, I, I put it up with myself. Because I, I keep hoping people will rip this off and it will show up in a magazine somewhere. It hasn't happened. <laughs> so this is just me. But when I came up with this, when I, I started uh, working with Reed Hastings, right? So everybody know, everybody know Reed, right? So everybody knows Netflix, right? Okay. So I met Reed in 1986. We're the same age. Um, and uh, and he, uh, he was in the Peace Corps in Swaziland. And his best friend in the Peace Corps was my best friend in my first job at SRI, this guy, Matt Brady. And so he introduced us, and we got to be friends. We met in a hot tub. <laughs> and that, that's actually, that's an okay story, because um, we met in a hot tub at my, my, at the time, my girlfriend, now my wife's house, and very Catholic. So they wore clothes in their hot tub. And so Reed always tells the story, it's like, it's the first time I ever had clothes on in the hot tub. <laughs> so, and it's true. Um, so we met in a hot tub. And I got to know him and eventually joined him and did this company, Pure Software, and that worked out pretty well. But the point of it is, this is how I learned with him. So when he started Pure Software, he was coming out of a graduate degree in computer science at Stanford. And a lot of the people that he tested his ideas, he had this, the Pure Software made this product called Purify that cleans up errors in code. And he tested it on a bunch of people he knew. So the university was very important from that perspective. When he went to try to get the company started, he raised $200,000 from friends and family. And so when you look at the red herring or the S1 associated with your software's IPO, you'll see Will Hastings, Edna Hastings, Jane Hastings, you see a lot of other Hastings that are in there. Because that's how he got his money raised. He raised $200,000 and he gave away 10% of the company for that. The vendors, um, you know, he met uh, some really good patent attorneys early in the process. They turned out to save the company later. I'm not worth getting all the details of it, but that was important. Uh, Audrey McLean was this woman who's now called the Angel of the Valley. She was one of the people who put money behind him. She was the CEO of a company called ADT. And she went on to start Pete Wade, which is a more fun company. Uh, and then he got associated with venture capital. Uh, two really good ones, Mike Leventhal at Mayfield and then Andy Radcliffe at Benchmark Capital. So, this kind of put it all together, and then this was me. So I was his first mercenary manager, and then we hired others. We hired other people that came in and helped. But it's all about servicing the entrepreneur. And so when I talk about the Silicon Valley experience or the entrepreneurship experience, I try to tell people there's a lot of ways you can play in here, right? You don't have to be this person. I've never been this person. I never will be this person. My brain's just not wired that way. Um, but I've been that person a couple of times. That worked out really well. And I've been in these other roles now, and now I'm in this role. Now this is what I do. Um, so that's kind of just laying the groundwork a little bit for the Silicon Valley. Now I'll talk about our firm, talk about Foundation Capital. So we're now about 18-year-old firm. We have about $3 billion under management. Um, you know, we, we're all ex-operating execs, so I'm 20 years of experience in high-tech stuff, and my partners are similar to that. And then we started some good companies, or we funded some early stage companies that have turned out to be turned out to be pretty pretty good. Um, so I want to give you a flavor about how the economics work in my world, um, because that's not bad either. It's not as good as when you're, you know, Steve Jobs, but it's not bad either in terms of how this happens. So Financial Engines is a company. How many of you know Financial Engines? You have to kind of be into finance to really know the Financial Engines. So okay, so Financial Engines is a guy named Bill Sharp. That name should resonate for some of you, hopefully. He won a Nobel Prize for uh, something called um, uh, Monte Carlo Simulations Applied to Finance. He created something called the Black-Scholes Method, among other things. Um, so he's a really, really bright guy. And then he had a graduate student named Jeff Magicola, a 27-year-old guy, uh, who's also a very bright guy. And they said, you know what, we're going to create software. It's 1997, so this is kind of radical at the time. We're going to create software as a service to manage your money. 
And so it's going to be like automatically manage your IRA and 401k money. And at the time, people said, nobody ought to want to do that, right? So it started the company. We funded it. Probably we put $5 million initially. But over time, we put more money in as the company grew. And uh, the company today is worth about $3.1 million. Bill Sharp's still on the board. Uh, he's, uh, he's, a, he's a much older gentleman. And Jeff Matricolta, who's in his, uh, in his uh, mid and early 40s now, is still the CEO, which is really cool. Um, so they created tremendous value. And then for us, it wasn't a bad gig either. We put in 23, we got back 125. Really, it's probably like the, most of what we earned on this, we earned on the first seven or eight million dollars we put in. The rest of it, we just had to put in to keep the company going and maintain our share. But that, those are those are very good economics. That's what, what makes our world work. Uh, Interwoven, similarly, you know, we're in seven now. The timing, this matters, right? So ninety-seven, March of ninety-eight. There probably wasn't a better time in history to be throwing darts at a board and putting money in companies than March of ninety-eight. So here it is, we throw $7 million here, and then we get $200 million back. We probably got that back in 24 months, right? That was a, that was a really good time. Um, and then uh, 99, so 99, ironically, wasn't as good a time. And why was 99 not as good a time as like 97, 98? Let's take a shot at that. Yes? Was that the dot-com crash? And what, what, about, what about 99? Where, where were you in the cycle at that point? Like, yeah. There's a little bit of that going on too, yeah. Precisely. So you're at the peak, right? Yeah, like you're 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 right at the top of the party. Everybody's having a good time. Can't go any better. And it's turned out they're right. So uh, when you invest in '99, it's riskier. A lot of the the the, the investment year 1999 for the venture community is one of the worst years in history because. Many of the companies we invested in in that year just blew up and never came back. Pets.com, anything.com. Now, Netflix was a different animal, as we know. Um, so we, stayed, we went in there. They nearly died eight times, not worth getting in all the details why. And, uh, and then we harvested about $120 million. Now, the, the sad thing for us is we harvested only $120 million out of the 28 because we sold the stock when the stock was probably worth, I don't know, $2 billion, $3 billion. It's one of the hard things about our business. Like two billion, three billion, that's not bad, right? Like time to sell. So we didn't know the company was going to go to twenty billion. <laughs> they told us that we were going to hold on to it. So, um, and then uh, Silver Spring is a recent example. We seed funded this company. They make uh, uh, the smart grid. They make uh, uh, essentially network network software based meters for the smart grid. And this is a current company. It's not quite at that rate right now. Um, but you know we did we did quite well with that company, but that that kind of gives you a flavor about how our business works when it works well. Now there's something else you should understand about our business. And I didn't get this because I only worked at two startups and they both went really well. One ended up being worth about four billion, another ended up being worth about nine billion, and that happened pretty quickly. So then I come into venture capital thinking this is great. I'm going to go do this again over and over again. I'm 12 years into venture capital. My first idea was next week. It's check. You guys have ever ordered books from check. So, um, but man, it's been a lot harder than I thought. And the reason is that you fail a lot. Like you fail 60% of the time. And that wasn't something I like had a consciousness of. I looked at it as like, well, if you fail in your job, well, that's just terrible. But when you're taking the kind of chances we take, you have to fail to a certain point, and you have to get used to failing. And ideally, you fail creatively. You fail quickly. Right? That's the best part of it. And fail with as little money in as you can. Um, let me talk about the current VC environment. And this may be a little bit inside baseball. I know some of you guys are in venture creation and things like that. So I won't, I won't go deep. If you want to spend time afterwards, I'll spend more time on this. But this is the stuff we think about today. Like in our world, this is sort of the grad level stuff that's going on. So Super Angels, people like Mike Maples and Michael Deering and others, started with little funds. Made a couple of good investments, and then now they're they're like the kings of the universe. Everybody thinks that they've got the golden touch, and you know that's that's they're they're good guys. Angel syndicates. This is a new concept. So this is brand new. They may have a concept. They may follow this stuff closely enough. They would have an opinion on angel syndicate. I don't expect you to do. It's not it's not like I mean I, I'm you know this is relatively new for us. Okay, so um, so here's how an angel syndicate works. What's your name? Nah. Richard. Richard. Okay, so Richard. Richard is like. He's the bomb, right? He's the hip hop happening entrepreneur, lives south of Market, South Beach, even better. 
Like, it's just the best. He was in Airbnb. He was in Uber. Right? I mean, he's in Looker. He's in all this great stuff. And he just knows all the hottest startups that are around. So what happens is, all oh, you guys know that. Because Richard's like, he's the guy <coughs> in the world. Right? So then, sorry, what's your name back there? It's, uh, you. Yeah. Uh, Evan? No, the one in front of you. The lady. Reen. Say it one more time. Reen. Reen. Okay, thanks. So Reen, Reen says, you know, I think Richard's got it going on. Like he's got he's got this whole like start thing figured out. So what's happening now? This this angel syndicate thing is very new. It's very different. It's actually there's some changes in laws and stuff. It's kind of complicated. But what happens is Richard says, I'm gonna what's your name? Ron. Ron. Okay. So Ron's got this new idea. I'll use a real one. You won't believe it. We just funded it. He's got this new idea. It's called DogVacay.com. Right? Dogs need a place to stay. And he's going to start DogVacay.com. I'm not kidding. We just put ten million in this company. So DogVacay.com. Richard hears about Ron getting started on DogVacay.com, and he says, "I want it. I want it. I want to put and, and I want to put fifty grand in your company." And Ron says, okay, that's cool, that's cool. And then Richard says, but I've got an angel syndicate. I've got brains, and I've got 20 other people. And every time I say I put 50 grand in, they put 50 grand in too. So I can get you a million to next week. And Ron's like, that's not bad. You know? And I'll give it to you on good terms. That's even better. And I, I trust Richard anyway, because he's the bomb, right? He's, he's great. So you accept that money. And this concept, this phenomenon, is very, very popular right now in my world. Now, we don't know where it's going to go, and there's some questions and some other things around it, but it's really interesting and really promising, and we've never seen this before. So it's going to be kind of interesting to see how this plays itself out. It competes with venture capital to some extent, competes with other angel forms of investment. And I know it sounds like a little too specific, and uh, why am I so excited about this? Because innovation is hard in our world for a variety of reasons, and this is really innovative, and it's going to take off. Like, there's going to be a lot more that's going to happen here. And the other thing that's big for us is, is exit. So uh, this year will be the best exit year since 2007, and that was the best exit year since 2000. So we got a lot of good stuff going on. Yeah, I got a company going public next week. We've had two this year. Um, Axel sold 50% of Supercell SoftBank uh, last week for $3 billion. Um, FireEye went out, it's worth $3 billion. Uh, Critio went out, it's worth a billion and a half dollars. So there's a, like a bunch of stuff going on. And we've had pipeline, we're like a dam. You know, the dam's built up, there are a lot of logs behind the dam. We've got a lot of stuff we want to get down the river. So the pipeline is ready, and we've got a lot of things going on in the market supporting that now. So that's a big part of what's going on. That has a bunch of different effects. We had this conversation with some of the faculty over dinner. One of them is it makes it for the Bay Area real estate market to be insane, right? We had our first $100 million house. That was a big deal. It's not that great of a house. I've seen it. And we had another $80 million house. So we got a lot going on because we got a very small area with a lot of money kind of getting <coughs> packed into it right now. And I'd love to have you guys get some of that money. That's, that's one of the points of tonight. So one of the things we do at Foundation is we, we play around with a couple things to try to give ourselves an advantage. One is, uh, I'll start here, entrepreneurs and residents. Um, this has been going on for a while. One of our founders might have been the guy that originated this back in the 80s. But if you look at the people involved, so Jeremy Herbert, Jeremy was the CEO of eHarmony. He's a guy we've known for a long time. He's a great guy. And he hangs out with us sometimes. Uh, Rebecca just sold a company for us for $55 million revenue company. She sold for $580 million. So we like her a lot. And, uh, and Natalia just joined us, and she has been at, at Twitter for the last few years, and prior to that has been in some other companies that are really interesting. So we bring in entrepreneurs and residents who have domain expertise, who have done some interesting things with interesting recently that can help us as a firm, but also who want to start companies. And maybe half the time they'll start a company that we fund, and the other half we don't fund it or they don't come up with a good idea or whatever. We're pretty tolerant of failure at that, that level. Um, young Entrepreneurs Program. So I started this program three years ago. Carol knows about this program. And uh, what I do is I hire, quote unquote, hire grad students at, at the schools that are listed here. And they're typically kind of the head of the entrepreneurship club or something like that. 
And they act, they act, they act like AWACS planes for us. They're just kind of circling their local area and circling the university. And they alert us to new startups, new things that look interesting to us, that, that could be interesting to us. You know, kind of the way we look at it is like if you're an artist, who would have loved or heard about this Facebook thing? Who would have That would be great. <laughs> but if not that, you know, there's some other stuff you can do. So they produce about three or 400 companies a year for us to evaluate because the entrepreneurship community in these metropolitan areas are really strong. One of the things, if I had this list up three years ago, which showed Duke and Princeton and Dartmouth, and we dropped all those schools because they weren't close enough to the plan. They, there was a, a lot of the big cities are where a lot of the big entrepreneurship stuff is happening. So we standardized around these guys. They're very, very sharp, and, um, and they've done some good work for us. Okay, so what are we thinking about today in terms of the market? Like, what sort of stuff do we look for? Where are we looking for our investments? So, mobile, both in terms of IT and consumer. So, I'll just mention a few of my investments. So, Mobile Iron is a company that secures smartphones and tablets in the enterprise. It's a good idea, especially now. Um, when I funded the company, they had 50 customers, and that was three years ago. They have 5,000 customers now. They probably had, I don't know, 20,000 users then. They have 4 million users now. So that's going pretty well. Um, I funded another company called Kit. Any of you guys use Kit? Right, good. Keep using it. Use it a lot. Um, so we funded Kit because we said, you know, this Facebook thing is getting long in the tooth. You know, it's kind of become a middle-aged photo sharing site. And uh, maybe something else will come along that will kind of capture people's imagination. So we funded Kit. We would have funded Snapchat. Turn out to be too hard to get in to do it, but we look at things like that. Video moving on the internet. I'll save this for a minute because I'm going to talk about one of the companies that we funded there. Same for peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces. So peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. A great example of that is Uber. How many of you have used Uber? It's this is more a little bit more of a business thing, but if you are in the urban areas, Uber's become like uh, can't live without if you live in the urban area. And that's the kind of thing you want to fund. You can help them. Okay, so. I'm going to close with this. I'll spend time on these six companies, just give you a little bit of a flavor for each one. <coughs> and these are companies from our most recent funds. So we've had seven funds. Uh, first fund was $75 million. That returned about $800 million. And that's why we have all the other funds. Because the first fund worked out so well. Everybody said, well, that's good. You guys must know how to do this. The second fund was good, too. That had Netflix and Net Zero and some other companies in it. Um, we're operating now at our seventh fund. But these are all investments from our most recently completed fund, which is Fund 6. Okay, so Sunrun. I'm not going to go through all the details of this. Does anybody know what a PPA is? When I say PPA, you know, kind of the end of sustainable stuff. But, yeah. Okay, so power purchase arrangement. Power purchase agreement. And the way it works is this. You, uh, Sunrun goes out and raises money. It's called tax equity funding. They've raised a billion and a half dollars this way. And it comes into them, and they use the money to go buy solar panels. And then they go, what's your name? Johnny. Johnny, okay. So they say to Johnny, Johnny has got a cool house in San Francisco, and he's thinking of solar. And then, so Johnny says, I heard about the Sunrun thing. I can put solar in my house for no money down. It's because they raised all this other money to buy the panels for you. So you call up Sunrun. I'm Sunrun's biggest customer. So you call up Sunrun, and you say, I want some solar panels. And they say, great. Tell us about your house. They know about your house because they can get all this online. And they say, send out a crew. Send out a crew. They put solar in your house. Starting the next month, you're paying about 80% of what you would normally pay for your power, and you had no money down. So why wouldn't you do that? And the answer is, you should do that. And tens of thousands of people have. And that's why Sunrun is going to be a really successful company. They, they invented the power purchase agreement model. Uh, in California, and they're in the 15 states that are amenable to solar. I don't think Virginia's one of those, sadly. Um, amenable means that the government actually supports getting solar on the rooftops. And uh, this is what their revenue rent <coughs> looked like. If you, if you go to work in a place and they say this is what their revenue rent is going to be and you believe it, you should go to, you should go to work there. It's a good idea. Because <laughs> um, you know, our hope would be that by the time the company gets out into this range, it will be worth yeah. One to one and a half billion dollars. Now that Solar City is worth four billion, and we, our sites are setting even higher. And um, you know, we put twenty million or thirty million dollars into this company, so we can get to where. And we own uh, twenty-six percent. So if they get out there and they're worth a couple bill, and the twenty million turns into five hundred million, then that's a good that's a good solution for us. That works well. Okay, Chegg is my company. Uh, um, when I first met the, the entrepreneurs here, uh, two young Midwestern entrepreneurs, 
Osman Rashid and Ayush Pumba. Um, and they were from the University of Minnesota. The University of Minnesota is very forward thinking. They have the highest percentage of foreign students on scholarship, and that's going to serve them very well. Um, and it did in this case. So, uh, Osman and Ajit Ayush, they were passionate young entrepreneurs. I think they were in their late 20s when I met them. And they wanted to do something around the college market. So they said, let's do Craigslist for colleges. And they did it. And the only thing that really sold were used textbooks because they, there was like an inefficiency in the market for used textbooks. So they built Chegg first out of that, and then we then went on and hired Dan Rosenzweig and other people. And now it's textbooks, but also digital services like homework help and things like that. So this revenue ramp comes out of their S1 because they're on file and they're supposed to, I'm going to New York on Wednesday to ring the bell on the stock exchange because they're supposed to go out on Wednesday. So that's the hope. Mobile Iron. Talked about them a little bit. Uh, the slides a little bit out of date. They've got over 3,000 uh, customers. The, um, the, I heard about the company through a guy that, who was kind of like my number two in my operating career. We funded him three times. We'll keep funding him because it seems to work. And their ramp has also been really nice. Now, if they if they achieve this, what's happened in the uh, in the enterprise part of the market? We say enterprise, we mean like companies. Then it was kind of dead for a while because it was all about Facebook and everything else. It was all social and everything else. Um, now this market's come back. Because companies like Splunk and Workday and FireEye, they're worth a ton. And so if we are able to hit these numbers, and we've hit all these numbers, by the way, if we're able to hit these numbers going forward, then you know we could be in a situation where the company is worth five or six or seven million dollars. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's going to be a good thing. Lending Club. Okay, so I'm going to spend a minute on, on this company. Now, this is where I get like I make you guys a little bit uncomfortable. <clears throat> so when I used to come and give talks at JMU, um, I would say, I don't blame you guys for not starting Intel. Because you'd have to have a PhD in semiconductor physics to start Intel. And we don't do that here. And I'd say, I don't blame you for you know, the people that didn't start like National Semiconductor, right? I mean, that's just not the kind of thing that we're going to do. However, the world's changed in the entrepreneurial world. I do start thinking when I see a Facebook or a Twitter or an Airbnb or some of the other companies that are coming out, I start thinking, why the hell isn't that a JMU-based company, right? What's stopping us from that? So like, I really want to push you all to think aggressively about things you can start because the technical barriers have really fallen around these things. I'm thrilled that we've got now an engineering program, a great guy to run it and all that, and that's going to help a lot. But that's not that's not the barrier anymore. It's just your own imagination that's the barrier. You're willing to kind of go dig in and figure out that, yeah, I need a place to stay. My couch is good. Why don't we charge for it, right? Um, so let's start thinking that way because it's like this group, this school, is one of the most evolved like, you know, emotionally, like, you know, we have one of the highest EQs on the planet. And we got to start using it out in this world. Here's a company we should have started. Okay, so here's what Lending Club does. They think, um, what's your name? Elsie. Elsie. Okay, so Elsie is a fabulously wealthy individual investor. Right, so she's sitting around, surrounded by Herman and drinking champagne for breakfast. She's lost her. But she's always looking for a better return. And the last few years, the return is stuck, right? I mean, you know, passive savings is like 1%, something like that. She's looking for a better return. What's your name? Drew. Uh, Drew, good enough. And you? Tim. Tim. Drew and Tim, they're in the same boat. They're pathological spenders. Right? They just can't help themselves. Uh, they're, you know, they're always thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 in debt to their credit card. But the good news is they've got a high credit rating because they you know, borrow a lot, but they pay it off. So this is the story about how Elsie and these guys have found a love connection, a financial love connection. So what Lightning Club does is they absorb investment through the top from individual investors, now institutions. Used to be we'd celebrate when they got a $100,000 investor, now we got guys writing $30 million checks into the platform. So we take money from the top, and then from the bottom are consumers who come in, and they're paying 21% credit card interest and they're really pissed off. And they've got good uh, FICO scores and so they qualify for Lending Club. And they come in, they can get a loan for 9.8%. All 
right? Which is a good deal. And LC, who's starved for return, is going to make 6% on that money. And if these guys are a little bit shadier in terms of their credit risk, they'll pay 12%, 13%, but that's probably because they're paying 24%. They might be doing hard money loans, payday loans, just crazy stuff. Um, and then LC's got a little bit higher appetite for risk. You might make 8 or 9% on those. And the beautiful thing about Lending Club is we keep the stuff in the middle, which is about 4.5% of everything we touch. Um, so that's why their ramp looks like this. Um, so this is a company that is going to be huge. And they're going to destabilize the banking industry. Because the banking industry counts on all of us to just go sheepishly and pile our money in to get these anemic returns and to go get these crappy loans out and have to deal with them and all that stuff. These guys are lovely to deal with, 100% internet based. Put your thing in, get your loan back, put your money in, get your return back, everything's great. Um, so this is a company that we hope will go public in probably May of next year. And uh, so we invested, we led the Series C on this company. Let's see if that shows up. Okay, so uh, we led the Series C, uh, which was at about uh, 80 post money. 80 million, the company was worth $80 million by the time we put our money in at the time we did it. That was a couple years ago. Uh, it's gone so well that we did, we led this round, so we didn't do that round. That was uh, Fred Wilson at U.S. Ventures. This doesn't show up. We led this round. So we led the Series E. We did that at a billion five. So we invested at a cost of a billion five because we think the company's going to be worth a lot more than that over time. So we own about 11% of the company. And this is the black swan. Like, this is the Netflix. This is the kind of company that we like. We spent our whole careers looking for. And unfortunately for us, my partner Charles um, found it. By the way, just so you understand, the way economics work in my world is it's, it's one for all and all for one. We're all getting paid exactly the same. Whether we our cash compensation and what we call carry, meaning the profit. So even though Charles found this company, I'm going to make a ton of money. <laughs> and even though I did check in mobile iron, he's going to be really happy when he sees the results after that. Uh, and then I think we're getting towards the end. So Two Mobile. Two Mobile is a fun company uh, because they're taking advantage of one of the largest trends that are happening over the last five years, which is the movement of video onto the internet. And you guys are like, yeah, it's a big deal. Of course video is on the internet. To brand advertisers, this has been a huge challenge to kind of catch up with you as consumers on second screens, third screens, you know, binge consumption, all this stuff. Um, TubeMobile has built essentially the advertising platform that figures all that out, to how to monetize video on the internet. And they're doing really, really well. Um, and it's and it's has the potential to be a very large company over time. This is what they've done so far. Very young crew. I think the you know, I think the CEO is maybe 32, 33, something like that. Um, but you know they spent their career kind of learning this stuff. And uh, and we think that's going to be worth a lot. So uh, this is not that big a deal. But we put this up for our investors partly to give them hope uh, and ourselves. Um, but what's fun about it is is that we're forecasting that we're going to return. Uh, 1.x of our fund, meaning we'll return $750 million, that's how much money was in this fund. And we think we're going to return all of that just on these companies. And then we've got 50 more companies behind it. Now, most of them aren't as good as these, but there are companies behind it. And so when venture goes well, it goes really well. And we're in a cycle right now where it's going well. And five years ago when I came in and talked to you, kind of hang dog, it wasn't going as well. But it's going really well now. Um, and these are the new things we did. So you thought I was joking, but well, we did this. We put ten million in the dog bag. So, really great guy. I mean, this is how we <laughs> know this guy. He's great. He said he loves dogs. <laughs> and, uh, so, but we think the company is going to be worth a fortune because it's a six billion dollar market to board dogs. You guys probably don't have to worry about it. your parents have to worry about boarding your dogs, but you know, people pay fifty bucks a night to board a dog. Um, so $6 billion a year, and so what this is, this is Uber for the dog boarding market. It's peer-to-peer -peer dog boarding. It's for uh, retired people, stay-at-home moms, students. They've now started dog boarding operations to just take casual dog boarding. 
And here's one of the reasons why we invested in this company. I'll skip the other ones now, but we're here why we invested in the company because when we looked at Uber, so we followed Bill Burley from Benchmark who invested in Uber and also was a Series A investor at, at Dog Bay Cake. When Uber started their business, people said, eh, you know, black car, you guys know what Uber does, right? So you get your app, you open up your app, and like, if I did it now, it would tell me that there's five cars within five minutes and the fastest guy to get here picks me up and takes me to the next thing. So this aggregates about a $6 billion market uh, for taxis and for black car. Here was the thing that really, really excited us when we looked at something like dog making. For Uber, in the San Francisco market, they really hit the San Francisco market for real probably four years ago and really started to scale over the last couple of years. San Francisco is their first major market. It's the case with a lot of consumer companies out of Silicon Valley. So the black car market in San Francisco, Uber's revenues today are three times what the entire black car market was five years ago. So they, how'd that happen? Well, they expanded the market. Right? They had people like me go, yeah, do I really need to get a black car? Eh, but I just punch this button, the guy kind of pulls right up. He's always nice. <laughs> Whoever's name is, he's always nice. I don't like here. And so they're doing that. So Dog AK, we looked at that and said, okay, if it's a $6 million market today, for people, it's 40, I have a dog, I love my dog, but it's a hassle, boredom, it's expensive, it's time consuming. And if I found a really good solution, I'd probably use it a lot more often than I do today. So it's one of the reasons we did that. So, and I'll give you, as we close, I'll give you kind of a, a breaking news thing. We're not going to do it, I don't think. But one of our, we have a young associate, uh, Scott Rodolfo from MIT, and he found this company. I don't know what the name of it is, but it's like cartrunk.com, because that's what they do. They rent car trunks. Um, and you think, okay, come on, that's a stupid idea. <laughs> it's kind of like a dog big head, right? That's a dumb idea. Well, you think about it, right? There are, I got to notice, what are there, 80 million cars in the US, something like that? And the trunks are mostly empty most of the time, and people are driving all over the place. What if you had GPS and you knew that when somebody was at the mall and then they were going to come out in this direction, what if they got a little alert that said, hey, if you stop by the, the Burberry and so you pick up this box, we'll pay you eight bucks. And you take it and go drop it off somewhere. So that's a, this is a startup that I think was started like three months ago at MIT. So we're looking at it now. So that's the kind of stuff I want to see Eric and the team here coming at it. So the hope today is to get you thinking about being an entrepreneur and start to generate some ideas. The other hope is that it reduce sort of the barrier to entry in your mind. Like, you don't have to be a genius to do this. I can assure you, I've backed a ton of these guys. They're not genius. They're very hardworking and very passionate about dog boarding or, you know, semiconductor metrics, whatever it is they do. Uh, but I would really urge you all to think, as you go forward and you think about your options and your career choices, think about the design software and offer sort of a nonlinear future that might be different than what you're having. Thanks a ton for coming out.